Welcome back from the break. Hope you had a refreshing moment. I've enjoyed a bit of coffee myself to clear my head and to get ready for the next rush to go into how we look at the energy demand and also we'll start to look at the recuperation. Previously we have looked only on demand but during the acceleration cycle can also deliver energy back to the vehicle for example if you would think about going both uphill and downhill the gravitation could also deliver energy back to the vehicle that can be utilized during driving. Now we will add recuperation that is regenerative braking and see what can be done there and then we will make a sensitivity analysis to see what design parameters gives the most impact in terms of fuel economy. Later we'll go through more modeling in terms of how to describe the equations and we will see something that was an eye-opener to me the first time I saw the inverse modeling thinking. And we'll look at engine models and we'll look at uh, some things now then that are related to fuel economy. At the end of the lecture we'll look at engine models and see how we can describe engine performance so that we can get to the point of evaluating fuel economy of a conventional vehicle. So the first part will be directed towards more conventional vehicles and then the other hand in assignments will be on hybrid electric vehicles and will be on control strategies for lowest possible fuel consumption while we use combustion engine and we use battery in the most optimal way. Now we come to the next item where we will look at regenerative braking and see how much energy we can recuperate from the driving cycle. Previously we have considered the energy demand from the cycle. We have looked at tractive force and how much requirement for tractive force we have. If we look at perfect recuperation, now we'll look into the aspect that the cycle can give energy back to the vehicle and utilize that to reduce the total energy consumption over the driving mission. Now we'll work on recovering the vehicle's kinetic energy during the braking parts and see how that influences. So, if we have perfect recuperation, it means that the mass effects, the acceleration and deceleration, will perfectly cancel each other. So the energy required to accelerate will be perfectly matched with the deceleration part where we get energy back. So terms we have to look at is that the tractive force is just the air drag and the rolling resistance. Newton's second law is with perfect recuperation returned perfectly. But now with some overall points and we get the following cycle data. So the numerical values differ slightly from previously but we have the air drag and we have uh, the rolling resistance. With perfect recuperation we get this equation that describes the energy consumption over 100 kilometers for a certain vehicle. If we turn to the difference without recuperation and with perfect recuperation we get the following numbers. At this time we also stop up and reflect about can we understand what's behind the numbers that we see from these results. So without recuperation we have these numbers and with perfect recuperation it looks like the numbers are higher which in fact is natural because uh, in this case when we're using all the kinetic energy to propel the vehicle we need to overcome the air drag. So these numbers are lower because in this case the air drag was overcome by the decelerations that came from this term. The rolling resistance is 1 because we're utilizing the wheels over the full distance. Previously we had some cases when the kinetic energy was overcoming the rolling resistance. We have some cases here when the decrease in kinetic energy was used to overcome the rolling resistance. This term is entirely gone in the equation because we don't need to look at how much energy we're building up because we're getting all that energy back in the perfect recuperation case. So now let's compare these terms for different vehicles. Here we have the regular vehicle that we looked at in the table on the last lecture and here we have the lightweight vehicle and this shows that the lightweight vehicle requires less energy for being propelled while the normal vehicle requires a little bit more. Here we see that the tractive part related to the air drag is slightly less and rolling resistance is also slightly less for the full vehicle but we have the added component here where we can't recover the energy completely. With perfect recuperation we could reduce the total fuel consumption with this amount but the air drag is slightly bigger and the rolling resistance is slightly bigger 
than the effects we see here but in this case we use the mass of the vehicle that stores kinetic energy to overcome these but with perfect recuperation this is not usable for a lightweight vehicle the situation is the same but with smaller numbers the next question we will look at is if we are making a design change how will that design change be reflected in the fuel economy or the energy requirement of a vehicle in the cycle so we will look at the design parameters that we do some engineering design to change the air drag making the vehicle either smaller or designing the slip streaming over the vehicles so we reduce the drag coefficient or we buy more advanced tires that have better rolling coefficients that have lower losses for the rolling or we buy tires that have lower rolling resistance losses and lower rolling resistance coefficient or we work on reducing the weight of the vehicle. We will look at the sensitivity analysis and that is we will use this equation so we will evaluate it uh, with a change in parameter and we we'll compare it to the nominal uh, value from the equation and then we will divide it by the change in the parameter and we will look at relative changes. So here we have a relative change in the total energy and here we have a relative change in the parameter. Another equivalent way of expressing the above equation is like this where we are looking more or less at the derivative of how the energy consumption depends on the parameters with respect to a normalized parameter change. If we do this sensitivity analysis we get the following results for the two different vehicles. We have the normal vehicle and we have the lightweight vehicle. The normal vehicle we see that while well, we have the air drag we have the rolling resistance and we have the mass of the vehicle and the same thing here but slightly different uh, in relation that the bigger vehicle has more effect of the rolling resistance than the air drag while the opposite is for the lightweight vehicle but the most important thing to see is that the mass is the most important parameter that's where we get most exchange for our design efforts this is one of the reasons why we see so much effort in lightweight materials in vehicles and reducing the weight of vehicles because this has the biggest impact on the fuel economy of our normal vehicle exterior design parameters. Another way of looking at the cycles and looking at uh, how they behave we have the following plot here where we have average velocities 50 kilometers an hour would require this much of energy if we go constant speed and if we would go 80 km an hour we would have uh, this point where energy requirement increases with vehicle weight. If we don't have any energy recovery then we get mass inertia effects that will cost extra energy demand over the cycle. Now we know that mass is important and that it costs extra so when we think about adding a recuperation device we will add things to the vehicle which will mean that we're adding mass and that's the next uh, diagram here. The nominal point is here when we have no recuperation. If we start to add components to this vehicle so we start to add batteries, generators, power electronics the weight will increase and if we have no recuperation then of course the fuel consumption will increase with the weight. What we see here is the sensitivity to weight. If we would have perfect recuperation and wouldn't need any additional mass we could go down here to the perfect recuperation but the recuperation device isn't perfect the electric machines the batteries have certain efficiencies so that we might be able to be in between 60 and 80 percent of cycle in cycle out the devices the realistic devices don't weigh zero kilogram they weigh some certain so we're in this region so it looks good here like we would be close to 25% but realistically we are in this region here where we are 10 to 15% benefits over the cycle. The next point now will be to work with models and we will look at two different ways of simulating vehicle so that the simulation is done very efficiently. And in the next lecture on Thursday we will look at usage of these kind of simulation tools to optimize the vehicle. The next step now is to look at dynamic simulation which I would say is standard simulation where we have specified a cycle that we need to follow and then we have a driver that drives the vehicle. 
The first approach that we look at is the dynamic approach, which is um, the normal simulation approach where we have a driving cycle that is specified like the cycles you have seen and that is transmitted into a driver so you can see yourselves that you're sitting in the vehicle trying to follow the cycle by looking at the speedometer of the vehicle and then controlling the gas pedal so that you get more or less torque from the engine that will push the transmission that will push the wheels and that will accelerate the vehicle. So this is a normal forward way where we are simulating according to the causality. Uh, we cause more fuel injection that will cause more torque that will more torque more torque and then more force to accelerate or decelerate the vehicle. This is called forward simulation because it follows the normal forward causality and it's a driver input that propagates to the vehicle uh, and this is a standard way of approaching simulation. It's a standard tool and it can deal with arbitrary powertrain complexities. The other simulation approach is quasi-static approach where you look at the system from the inverse side. You look at the cycle and then when you have the cycle you wonder okay what would the energy demand be for the vehicle and then you request that force from the wheels that in a turn will request that torque from the transmission that will request that torque from the engine and the engine here will output the fuel requirements to follow the cycle so this is called backward simulation because uh, you look at the system from backwards it's you're not going backward in time but you're going backward in causality normally the fuel goes into the engine and the information progresses out here but if you have perfect knowledge of the cycle you can use that to follow the cycle perfectly by calculating all the torque requirements and finally the energy requirement from the engine so this is called backward simulation or inverse simulation where we have at all we have an inverse model of a vehicle so we look at the output and we question okay what should the input be and at the same time here we have the output to the wheel we wonder what the input will be we have the output from the transmission and wonder what the input should be and the same finally here we have the desired torque and we wonder what the fuel injection would be normal simulation tools are not directly designed for this so when you want to simulate uh, using the quasi-static approach you have to do your modeling yourself and tailor the tool so that it can solve these equations but you will get very efficient simulation so this is a new way of approaching it and get efficient uh, evaluation of fuel consumption there are some tools like modelica that are equation oriented and doesn't uh, rely upon normal causality but can use equation solvers to do the inversion uh, for you so there are a lot of things opening up here and there's also a pointer to some research works that have been looking at inverse simulation. We have two approaches now for powertrain simulation. We have the forward simulation, we have the cycle and we have the driver that sits here. And the thing that differs between this and the quasi-static is that we have, can have more or less the same models here with the engine with the transmission, with the wheel, with the vehicle. So the vehicle model can be more or less identical. But the big difference is that the forward simulation relies on that we have a driver that can follow the cycle. The first time I saw this, it was an eye opener to me because the inverse modeling gives a very efficient way of doing the computations by inverting the model. So we have different model causality or calculation causality. There are tools that implement this way. For example, we have the QSS toolbox that you will use in this course, where you can see we have the driving profile here. You recognize the NEDC, which has velocity, it has uh, acceleration, it has uh, gear number, and it propagates this first to the vehicle. And then when we have it at the vehicle, it's pro that one is propagating it to the gearbox, and we're propagating it to the engine and finally when we have fuel flow from the engine we can integrate it and we can get the total fuel consumption over this cycle so this is very efficient and you can compute a complete driving cycle in less than a second inside these boxes it's essentially what the things that we have gone through previously in the vehicle model we have newton's second law and then we have gearbox where there can be losses and the internal combustion engine where there is an engine also the rest of this lecture will be devoted to the combustion engine and uh, how we can model it so that it fits into this kind of framework. And then later in the next lecture we'll work with the gearbox and we'll put everything together into one complete system and start analyzing the complete system. 
Now we turn the attention to the internal combustion engine models. We will look at how we can model it both with the normal way and how we model it with the quasi-static approach. So high level modeling inputs and outputs. In the quasi-static approach we come with information from the gearbox. The gearbox has a certain angular velocity and a certain torque request and the task of the combustion engine model is to tell how much chemical power we're consuming. In the dynamic approach the driver has used the gas pedal to request a certain flow of fuel that gives a certain power of fuel flow into the engine that will result in a torque that will drive the vehicle forward and the engine together with the vehicle is determining what angular velocity we have coming from vehicle side. So here you see a simplification that's nice in the quasi-static approaches that we're coming with a request and we only have to calculate the fuel flow while here we have to have separate parts determining different things. For example the vehicle together with the gearbox determines how fast the engine will rotate while the fuel flow determines how much torque the engine will generate. The engine efficiency can be calculated uh, directly from the power here divided by the fuel power input that we have. And it's the same thing here, it's the same equation for the engine efficiency but the way we calculate it is different in the two different cases. And this fuel power here is the same thing as enthalpy flow of fuel which is the mass of fuel flow times the lower heating value of your fuel. So this is the total power that is delivered by the fuel to the engine. So let's look now at how this kind of engine efficiency can look like for an example engine. So in this case we have a turbocharged engine where we have a map. You can recognize the um, altitude profiles here. We have longitude and latitude. So on the x-axis here we have the engine speed. So this is like the rev meter. And the y-axis here is the output torque. And that could be seen as the gas pedal position. So more gas, less gas. This efficiency map is determined by running engine tests to extract the fuel consumption and to extract the torque that is generated. And these kind of maps are often used to estimate fuel consumption of current vehicles and also of future design vehicles. So this is the main engineering perspective that we use this kind of efficiency map to improve our designs, to evaluate the impact of design changes on the fuel economy. So what to do when map data isn't available? So if we are aiming to build a new engine but we don't know exactly how it will perform, what can we do then? And that is uh, the purpose of the next coming slides to give you a methodology where you can use previous data to build a future engine model that is scalable. This is just to show you the illustration of a cylinder where you have a piston and you have the crankshaft here so this one is rotating giving making the piston go back and forth. Important design variables are the size of the engine, which will depend on the number of cylinders and it will depend on the individual cylinder's volume. And the individual cylinder's volume here are determined by the bore and the stroke length. So this gives the total displacement volume of the cylinder in here. And when you put them together in multi-cylinder you have the number of cylinders Z and you can get the total engine swept volume. The amount of torque that an engine can produce depends strongly on how big the engine is. So we would like to be able to express our performance in terms of the size of the engine. One thing that you also can think of is that uh, you see a strong trend in downsizing that most manufacturers are selecting smaller and smaller engines to get more and more fuel economic vehicles. One of the parameters that we will use in the modeling is uh, called mean effective pressure. And the mean effective pressure is the work and you divide it by the displacement volume of the engine. So work is energy that the engine is producing and the displacement volume of the engine. This quantity can be seen as a normalized quantity of the work output that normalizes uh, the work with the size of the engine. The engineering perspective here is then if we can build a good model in the mean effective pressure domain then we can use that to scale with the displacement volume and get the generic engine model that will give us the work output of the engine so that we can scale the work output with the displacement volume. A bigger displacement volume will give more work output. And then we can use that to evaluate the design impact that different engine sizes have on our fuel consumption. This opens up 
possibilities for selecting engines for optimal fuel economy for a vehicle for example. Other normalized variable mean piston speed that normalizes the piston movement to uh, an average velocity of the piston. This relates so this could be seen as a scaling of the engine angular velocity. We have the mean piston speed in the book the mean effective pressure is denoted PME and that PME gets this expression for a four stroke engine that has nr equal to two. These parameters are used to compare performance for engines of different sizes and it can also be used as design rules for engine sizing. There are some examples in the book where you can look at engine sizing requirements so that you can for example specify a certain engine power and then you can get the result engine design values for your desired performance. We will mostly focus on the mean effective pressure here in the book. There is much more written about the mean piston speed and these designs. But when we work with the mean effective pressure, torque modeling through the Willans lines. Here we have fuel energy on the x-axis. On the y-axis we have output work of the engine. This shows how efficient the engine is. It shows how the fuel is converted into output work. When we look at this relation between the fuel energy and the, the work that the engine is producing we see that it's fairly linear but the line does not pass through the origin so we have an offset and that is a affine model so linear models would go through the origin but if we put this affinity in we put this constant which is related to friction losses and pumping losses in an engine we can get a quite good description of the behavior by this type of affine relationship gives a good description of how the output torque relates to the fuel that we're injecting. And if you look at this affine relationship, um, the standard model is called the Willans line model. And it is constructed using an asymptotic efficiency. This asymptotic efficiency is the inclination of this line. And loss term here is where this line crosses the y-axis down here. If we draw a line from the origin to a certain point up here, like this point, the slope of this line will be the same as the efficiency at this point. This point has efficiency zero because the output is zero and the slope is zero. And we can also see the maximum slope that we can get from the origin is up to this point up here. So this point is the maximum efficiency point that we see for the engine and the maximum efficiency point is usually attained up at the highest loads for the engine. Maybe not the absolute peak load but up at the higher region at least of the engine. So the engine is most efficient up at its high load point. Turning to the equation and to the terms we have the asymptotic efficiency and we have the loss term. They are depending on the engine speed and that is why you are seeing a certain spread here because in this diagram we don't see the speed we only see the relation between fuel and work output if we look at how these depend on the speed you can get the following behavior so that the asymptotic efficiency is the best in the mid region and the loss term increases with increased speed so what you're seeing here is the increase in friction so more friction gives higher loss while the efficiency that's connected to this axis here has uh, more or less a sweet spot in the middle while it's counteracted a little bit by this increase in losses due to engine friction and engine pumping. So now we have a tool to scale the torque with engine size we can work in the mean effective pressure domain uh, and we also have the tool of the Willans line to describe the performance of engines. And then we have come to the conclusion of this lecture. After this lecture you can meet me in the query and answer session on Zoom where you can pose questions about the course and about the topics in the lecture. So hopefully see you there.